Panelists are here already. I'm sure this is going to be a fascinating panel on an aspect of Kosoli that few of us would have thought to examine. It's about the natural history of Kosoli. One question that I'd really like uh, to get answered is, did the Saraswati really originate in this region? OK, over to you. All of you uh, have been to Kasoli before or coming for the first time. Somebody like me has actually studied here and lived in Kasoli. And I never realized till this morning when I was told that I was supposed to talk to my friend Pranay that he's going to talk about the natural history of Kasoli Hills. What is natural history of Kasoli Hills? I thought it was some pine trees, some gravel. But you know, the couple of hours that we spent together has left me completely, you know, mesmerized. I don't know enough about the subject to talk to you or even to give you an introduction. But uh, Pranay calls himself, or he doesn't call himself, others call him a biochemist, some call him a caricature. I call him the best writer in India at the moment. Believe me, he's written Indica, which is brilliant. And those of you who's read The Invisible Empire, his book on the viruses will be absolutely stupefied by what you read. I'm going to try at the end of our talk to bring him around to some of the other questions. But in the moment, in the next hour, half an hour or so, I think he should, he should talk about the natural history of Kasali or the lower Shivaliks. Thank you, Vikram. I think, uh, am I audible? Is this good? Yeah. Okay, great. So, louder? Okay. I think, yeah, the volume's being ramped up. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Vikram. You're always so uh, generous with praise, and uh, I'm so happy to be, you know, I've shaken hands with Khushwan Singh. What an incredible person. So I'm a little in trepidation that I'm here. Uh, and thank you, um, the organizers. Uh, they look for, thank you for persisting to have me here. So. Um, I'm going to stand up because yep. my excitement with rocks and natural history is such that I can't sit. So I feel bottled up. So uh, I'm going to tell you a story which I think most of you may not have considered when you travel across in this terrain. And I imagine that all of you have come uh, traveling from Chandigarh and have taken the road trip from Chandigarh, Kalka. Okay, I need to keep the mic up. Okay. Um, you know, you've taken the road trip from Kalka, uh, Chandigarh Kalka to here, right? So I'm going to take a transect. I'm going to do a road travel and tell you how fascinating it is if you were to just look around and see the rocks and they have an incredible story to tell you. I arrived last night, so I uh, took that opportunity of this morning to travel, you know, retrace my steps to, you know, look at the rocks early in the morning. So I, I'm sorry I missed Amitav if he's here. And, uh, you know, the other sessions that happened, which I believe were brilliant, I'm sorry to have missed them. But, you know, I did some homework and I wanted to bring that granular perspective of understanding the rock and also tell you what to see where. So let me not take more time and start a deep dive into the 45 million year history of how this rock upon which we sit today, all of us are sitting on it just now. So if we travel from Chandigarh northwards, uh, towards, uh, you, know, you know, coming to as far as Par Parvanu, we would have crossed a place which is called the Bilaspur Thrust. Now, it's a big, wide area. It looks as if it's been a canal that has been cut across. It's not. It's natural, right? Now, that's a thrust means it's an area that has been pushing itself northwards. India has been pushed northwards after it broke away from Madagascar. 88 million years ago, and the Deccan lava flow that happened, there's a big Deccan flow that is happening still in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Now, that's what is pushing India northward. So all these earthquakes that we feel, the last one, the major one we had was in Nepal, right? The Gorkha earthquake, the tragedy that happened. 
those earthquakes are indicators that we are still moving northward. So India is going to, maybe over the next 50 million years, is going to be completely reorienting itself. It's going to twist around Assam and Nepal. It's going to get crushed there. That's going to be another story for another time. But what I'm trying to tell you is that there's a constant push that is happening here. And so as you come to Dharampur, you know, when you come to this chalk where the when you take your left coming into towards uh, uh, Kasoli, I want you to, the next time you go and you cross this place just after Timber Trail, just look up the rock that you see up there. It's a fascinating rock. You see a very large part of that mountain which has a very massive olive green, dirty olive green colored rock. That's a mudstone doesn't look too impressive. It, when it rains, it looks shiny. It's pretty to look at. Uh, lots of people at Timber Trail like to keep it as a backdrop. Now that rock is really, really old. It's perhaps one of the oldest rocks that are found in this region. And that belongs to the Subathu formation. Now, all formations in this region are named after a locality. So they're not named after some Greek god or a Hindu god or any such thing. Thankfully, they're named after localities where they were identified first. So you've got the Subatu formation, which is old, and it formed about 44 million years ago, and it took a couple of million years to, to make. So it took another 15 million odd years till it became the rock that we know. So the Subatu formation is, is interesting because if you were to look at places where it is not consolidated and it has these layers of rock, you're going to find fossils in it. So there is a lot of fossil in the rocks that you have here, right? What I'm trying to draw your attention to is that even in a dead thing like a rock, you've got mysteries of the past, incredible creatures that no longer exist, uh, incredible trees that, do no, that no longer exist. So as you leave, Dharampur, and you come and look at this olive green, dirty olive green uh, rock, which we call shale. Uh, it's got, uh, it's pretty easy to find uh, uh, fossils of snails and uh, and fish, and teeth of fish rather than more than uh, uh, and snails. Let's move now a little, uh, about four kilometers, and we reach this road, which takes us closer to the Sanavar School and you know, which is called the Sanavar Gadkal Kasoli Road, right? I think, is that the name? I don't know what the name is. I'm sure they, there must be a local name to it. But as you come to it, uh, just stop at this place where we fork and stop at the Baba Balaknath Temple, right? You come there and there's a, there's a rock there which is very, very interesting. The Subathu rock there has a slightly different color. It's a little purple rather than the green color. Now, what does that tell me? It tells me something else. The, the olive green color was made in a condition where the sea and the fresh water was meeting and creating that green rock. The rock that is purple in color is entirely marine because it has more oxygen. The iron oxidizes. Now, I'm sorry I'm taking you back to your boring chemistry class, but you know it's important for us to understand this. Why so? Because it has serious implications for climate change that we are facing now. I'm going to come to that a little later because Kasoli has a part in the larger story that we're going to talk about in climate change. Let's move a little further from the Balaknath, uh, uh, ba the Balaknath temple. Come, let's come closer to the, uh, uh, to, um, you know, the brewery road. The brewery road is, is, is the old brewery road, I believe. Uh, I don't know what it's called now because I asked the locals what is it called and they said, this place is called brewery road. I said, okay. Now there you have the, the Kasoli rock, the Kasoli formation, that yellowish rock, which actually when it's cut and it's not, I mean, it's been exposed for a long time, it becomes a little grayish and brown. So it doesn't look attractive, but if you were to chip it, you, you find that it is slightly orange brown in color. Now that's the Kasoli rock. So you've got the Subathu rock, you've got the Dakshai rock, and you've got the Subathu, uh, sorry, the Kasoli formation. So you've got three rocks to remember, right? And they're easy because all of you know uh, these cantonment areas, right? I mean, these are popular towns in this region. What makes this rock fascinating is that on the brewery road, you just don't have to look for more than half an hour and you will find your 
incredible fossils of logs, and the logs are big. They're big logs. They could be as big as uh, a foot across, and they're cross sections that you can look through. You find twigs, you find fossils of flowers. And they are flowers of trees that are now found, or their distant cousins are now found in central India. Things like Maduka, you know, from which we make Mahua, right? That tree used to exist here 18 million years ago. Now, isn't that funny? So this place was entirely tropical. You would have had the ancestors of the tigers and the rhinos. They found uh, fossils of bears and hyenas and rhinoceros. Rhinoceros bone, incidentally, and even very large elephants are rather common in this region. But this place is also very popular for people who are hunting for the ancestors of the whales. India was the incubator, or rather this region, south of the Simla Hills, was one of the places where the whales evolved. And the earliest whales to have evolved were not water-dwelling. They were actually a little like, a, like pigs. They were small land-dwelling animals that wanted to find new niches to find new kinds of food. And they found a liking to water plants. And they, these small pig-like animals, very tiny, would duck into the water, feed and graze on the water plants that were in shallow lakes and shallow ponds and emerge later. And that's how the earliest whales, the mammals returned back to water. Right? The mammals would return back to water four more times. You know, the otters, for example, right? or the manatees and the sea cows. Now, we also find the sea cow, the manatee. I think most of you know what the manatee is. Beautiful, very gentle creature that lives in shallow seas and lagoons. We found bones here as well. When I say we, I mean my, my gurus in the paleontology world. So while you come here, you have actually crossed a journey of 40 million years, and you have seen the landscape change, the types of rocks have changed, and there is a, a bounty of, of fossils and mysteries written in the rocks. You know, there are signatures of chemicals and, and minerals which tell stories. And to me, that is fascinating because if you really want to understand how India was made, I don't want to affront uh, uh, Pawan because he's talking about the Hindu civilization, that's you know a second ago, but for me, the 40 million years uh, when this rock was was being created and the and and was was in in the making, I think that is a fascinating story which we now need to understand more intensively. I mentioned to you the fact that the Kasoli rocks and the Shivaliks and the larger region has a very very important role in the climate change that we are facing today. Now. I don't want to hard sell my book, but you know, when I wrote about this in 2016-17, that the answer to climate change is going to be largely geological. And I know Nilofar is going to hate me for this, but tree planting is only a very, very good way to avert climate change in the very short term. If you really want to fight climate change, you will have to plant not just trees, but also take care of your oceans and seas and shallow lakes. Now let me tell you why this rock is important. The rock here in Kasoli has been witness to the evolution of the monsoons. We have records in the layers of the rocks here of how the monsoon's intensity grew over the past 40 million years. In fact, till 18 million years ago, there was a very scanty monsoon. If you could even call it a monsoon, it was uh, it would be problematic. So the current monsoon regime has actually come into its shape about somewhere between 4 to 2.8 million years ago, not before that. It's only after the Himalayas have risen to what they have and the majestic rivers that started to flow after the assault of a regular, sustained, strong monsoon. I still need to come back to my climate story because I'm digressing, I understand. Why is it important that we conserve the rock here, the sediment that flows into the, uh, the Kosalia River and the, Mak and the Makrand River and all the other rivers that flow from here? The sediment that flows from the Himalayas is unique. It is not found anywhere else in the world. Anywhere else in the world. 
You have great rivers like the Amazon or the Nile or the Yangtze or the Orb and Yenisei in, in Russia. None of them have the ability to sink carbon. When I said trees are not going to save us, that's because trees have a propensity to consume oxygen and trap carbon dioxide, but they do so only at the cost of their own growth. And as soon as they grow to the certain level that they do, they start to decompose or they catch fire like the ones we are seeing now, right? So the, it is a natural cycle for forests to start decomposing or to ignite, right? And thereby releasing carbon dioxide which has not got trapped and buried. Remember that all the fossil fuel that we are getting out is from coal and petrol which was made 240 million years ago or 100 million years ago. And when you take it from the depth of the earth, it releases carbon dioxide, right? Trees are not going to solve your problem because you're taking out so much coal and petrol. So where does Kasoli fit in or the rocks around it or the sediments in the rivers? This is where it fits in. Ganga buries 22% of the world's carbon. Can you imagine this? You know why it happens? You know why only Ganga and a little bit Indus if the Indus was still powerful? and a little bit Brahmaputra, but not Yamuna, not Chambal, not Kosi, not Ghaggar, not Kaveri, none of them. That's because the tributaries that come from Nepal and make Ganga, they carry with them silicate, which is a very, very important component that has the ability to capture carbon. Let me explain it to you. As India collided with Eurasia, and it became India, it started to raise the Himalayas. And the young granite that came up was rich in silica. Now this is the youngest granite in the world. And the quality of this granite is such that it is flaky. Once rain falls on that granite, it etches out this silicate, right? Now, remember that rain, when it falls down, it's not pure water. It's actually something called carbonic acid because once rain falls down, it's taking with it some carbon dioxide as it falls down. So it's a mildly acidic uh, water that falls on that rock. It dissolves, it etches this granite. This granite silicate combines with this carbon dioxide, gets carried and buried in the Bay of Bengal. Now the Bay of Bengal itself is not an inert place. It has an amazing array of submarine canyons. In fact, nobody's even mapped the nature of the submarine canyons that exist there. And they are much grander, much grander than the Grand Canyon in America or any other canyon that you can imagine, right? But the, 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 the tragedy is that we don't have enough research uh, intent to actually do that mapping. And we don't know what that maze looks like. But what happens is, the point that I'm making here is, that the silicate that gets carried with the carbon dioxide is what controls the carbon dioxide largely that nature wants to control in the oxygen carbon dioxide cycle. So the Kasoli sediment, the Kasoli rock, all of these contribute to that river, that movement of silica down the sediment to the rivers that are going eastwards towards uh, the Bay of Bengal. And they all contribute to this process. So the point that I'm making here is that geology is not inert. The rocks got made 40 million, 50 million, 3 billion years, 4 billion years ago does not mean that they have stopped contributing to the role of evolution, whether it's the evolution of climate, evolution of landscapes, or the evolution of how things will shape in the future. So Bikram, I'm going to stop here unless uh, you know, somebody stops me. Just continue for another five minutes okay. because uh, everybody's fascinated by it. <laughs> okay. I, I don't know what. Yeah, there you are. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I'm not against trees. Please don't get me wrong here. You know, my only thing is that what I'm trying to say is that this whole logic of overemphasizing on uh, planting trees needs also to shift towards looking at lakes and ponds. It only makes sense because lakes and ponds are the place which not only provide you water security for very selfish reasons, but also does very, very good carbon burial.
carbon burial, like I said, has to go back into deep into earth. So the next time somebody tells you that we are doing enough, you know, a corporation tells you or a foundation tells you that we are planting enough trees, ask them what are you doing for lake preservation and for ponds. You know, this is an important part. And if they can do seas and oceans, even better. You know, because trees are going to decompose, trees may catch fire, trees may be used for building, you know, furniture or whatever. That's not going to solve your carbon crisis. We are taking out far too much from the earth and burning it up. Trees are not going to take, uh, take that carbon out, the excess carbon out. It's like a ledger, you know, it's like a accounting book. If you were to put the left hand side, the, the things that you're taking out and how much you are trapping, it's a huge imbalance just now. And I think we are fooling ourselves if we are saying planting trees is going to help us fight climate change. God be with you. It's not going to happen. Because that's not how it has happened in the past. Now, again, geology tells you this. You know, Earth's history tells you that uh, you know, there were phases when carbon dioxide levels were very high. Vegetation, along with tectonic processes, more so tectonic processes and the ocean chemistry that changed the or brought back the balance of oxygen and carbon that spurred evolution again. Pranay, why is it that if you, what you're saying is so common at these hills and other hills and other places, why don't we, our schools have it? Why aren't there any museums? Why you're not allowed to take photographs in them, wherever there are museums? Well, that's a larger question. I think that uh, that's a that's a curse that we have with all museums in India. I mean, whether it's historical uh, objects or any other thing. I mean, you can't even go to, say, the, uh, the National Archives of India and take photographs. I think that's a mindset issue. I think uh, we are looking at a larger problem of how pedagogy is designed. I don't think we encourage children to look at things critically. Critical thinking is absent. Uh, I think, you know, th this is a... This is a debate which I think uh, needs to be taken to uh, educationists and you know people who need to understand what revisions we need in terms of uh, uh, of looking at how future society is going to be. To revert to your, what you were talking about, th this when you talk about the Kasali rocks, Vatu rocks, how long does it stretch? Does it stretch all the way up to Dehradun where you have the uh, Kala Am? Kala Am. Uh, Right. Yeah. So, uh, good question. Sorry, I should have said this. So, the Kasoli Rock, the Kasoli Formation, is about 35 kilometers, if you were to look at it as in, in terms of breadth, you know, starting from uh, just south of Dharampur, and it goes uh, 35 kilometers north, and it goes into a band of about 100 kilometers east to west. So, it just, but that doesn't mean that the rock then gets absent. It, the only thing we know is that the rock subsides below another rock. For example, in uh, Dakshai, the Dakshai rock, although is older, in some places the Dakshai rock has come up. And that's what happens when, you know, the collisions happen. Some rocks topple over the other. So a younger rock may have got sub subducted or, you know, come under an older rock. So that also happens and it's funny because you have a younger rock beneath, uh, beneath the older rock. What, what we imagine is that you have younger rock on top of the older rock and it's like a, you know, a natural sequence. Sometimes, you know, uh, nature plays tricks because you've got collisions happening and, you know, a lot of those uh, uh, upheavals happening on, on, the sea, on, the, on, on, on land surface. So it's, it's very interesting in that sense. I'm going to uh, take your talk to a log slightly uh, further logical extension as it were. In your books, you have mentioned that these rocks may contain viruses unknown before. Is that true? Well, um, and you might end up uh, <laughs> having another pandemic which we know nothing about. Well, it's not going to be rocks that are going to release. Or underground or in the glaciers. Sure, or sure. So, yeah, there have been these uh, discoveries that have been made in, in, uh, in the peat bogs and the in, 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 in the uh, Permian region of, uh, of Russia where they've discovered mammoths. You know, they've found frozen mammoths that were very well preserved. They had soft tissue and their bones, they are, they're virtually intact. And what they found was that the 
bacteria and the viruses that were in the gut and in the lungs of these creatures, they were alive. So the good news is that none of these creatures that have been discovered have crossed over or have the potential to cross over into humans. So don't get alarmed as yet. But what it also means is that we know very little about the microbial world. You know? uh, for example, uh, until 1988, we did not know which was the largest photosynthesizer in the world. We thought trees were the biggest photosynthesizers, you know, the biggest engines of photosynthesis. We were completely wrong. The biggest photosynthesizer is actually the smallest known bacterial cell and it's found in the ocean in the first 40 meters of oceans and it's found right across all oceans and they produce roughly 35 to 40 percent of all the free oxygen that you and I breathe and they've been doing it for four billion years right now isn't that amazing that we did not know about them till 1988 till a PhD student called Sally Chisholm discovered it and then she made this uh, revelation to the the scientific world it wasn't taken even today most scientists would not be able to tell you which is the biggest photosynthesizer certainly most people do not think of oceans being the the engines that produce all the oxygen or sink all the carbon our carbon sinking and the oxygen production happens largely in the oceans not on land you have we have a fetish for land uh, that's our bias. I think we need to leave it. But remember, it's these organisms, and if they were not to produce oxygen, uh, or say if they were to go on strike, like we do, right, for a week, it would be, it'll be hell. You know, everything above, say, 40 kilos or 60 kilos would die. Elephants, us, I mean, you know, we would just perish. We know this from previous extinctions, that, you know, when oxygen levels decline, the heavier creatures that live on land are the first to die, right? So oxygen limitation, carbon cycle, all of these are interlinked and we need to respect what happens in the quiet tides and, and the waves of oceans and lakes and estuaries. Uh, this is something that we have paid very little attention to. I think uh, if we really want to make a difference in terms of climate change, conservation, and the sustainability of life in the future, we should be looking at things other than land. I mean, let me not say, let me not run down tree planting alone. <laughs> you know, one of the great joys of being with Pranoy is he wears so many hats and he knows so many things that talking to him is possibly the easiest thing. So you, we just spoke about, you know, your, where the land where you're standing is, was full of whale-like, pig-like creatures. And now I'm going to take it to a completely different thing. And this is all you can read all about uh, all this. It is both his books. Uh, sorry, this is a bit of a political question. How successful were we, when I say we, I don't want to put the government or anyway, in hiding the after effects of the pandemic in India? You know, I'm sorry about this, but... You know, I'm going to lose my job. I work for a non-profit yes. organization which uh, actually does... Good, you, can, you can concentrate on writing is what we want you to do. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, if you were to ask me honestly, I think uh, we had problems in terms of infrastructure and, you know, health system delivery. But let me also say this, that had we not had doctors the kind that we have, people who know how to manage fevers year in and year out, season after season, day after day. Uh, we, our doctors, our nurses, our pharmacists, our paramedical staff, our ASHA workers, you know, all of them know how to manage fever. Now that's a skill that very, very few countries have. So we did that incredibly well. So people who would have, you know, perhaps there would be far more death had we had not had this skill, you know. So fever management is critical, whether it's dengue, chikungunya, influenza, COVID, whatever, you know. So I think that training that we get in India in the public health system is incredible. And I think we need to celebrate that. Of course, there are deficiencies. We've, we've made uh, uh, serious goof-ups. Uh, I think states made mistakes. The center made mistakes. Uh, but that was a trial and error. I think 
it was a time which when people knew nothing about the virus. But, but nevertheless, I think the doctors and the entire public health system was ready. I, the only deficiencies we had is the ones that we heard that, you know, ivermectin nahi hai, but ivermectin is not supposed to be used, right? That's not the medicine for improving or fighting the lung infection, right? We knew this. Was but, there a perception problem as, uh, by the government, for instance? You know, when you had bodies turning up at the Ganga, they pretended that all was well. Was it well? Safe by the bell. I, I know. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, before I let him answer, the bell has rung, and I think we should answer a few of the questions sure. of the audience. Is there somebody who would like to ask a question? Yes, please. Is the lady in uh, green? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, is there a uh, mic? No, no, no. Hang on. She is. Uh, somebody's giving a mic. Uh, Nilofa, is there a mic for her? You got it good. Hi, I had, I'm going back to your lecture where you talked about uh, canyons that were deeper than the Grand Canyon in the US. Roughly, what location in India, on the subcontinent are you talking about? I'm talking about the Bay of Bengal. Now, the power of the Ganga and Brahmaputra was such that it, you know, etched out. Yeah. Uh, the the sediment load, yeah, sediment load. Let me give you an example. Uh, if you were to look at the sediment that came from Indus, so Indus was the most powerful river till about 11, 12 million years ago. The, the silt, the sediment that what got washed down from the Indus comes as far south as Kerala or even slightly beyond till about middle of Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. Now that's the power of the, of the river, Indus. If you were to look at the lateritic, the orange color uh, soil that the, uh, the Amazon sends out, right? And if you were to look at it on the, at the, uh, at, on the ocean's floor, on the seabed, uh, it perhaps goes to about 100 or 200 nautical miles, not more. Now here we are talking about a good 2,000 nautical miles, right? So that was the power of, of Indus. And the same thing in case of, of Ganga and Brahmaputra. The power was such that it etched out a slightly shallow basin sea into something much deeper. And so the sediment of the Ganga and Brahmaputra actually go down as south as middle of Nicobar. Yeah, if you see it from the air, you see that whole stretch before it mingles that's right. with the sea. That's right. So that's where the canyon is. As that's well. right. I'm saying. Okay. Thanks. Are there any more questions? Yes. Yes, there are many questions. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, you want to? Uh, I think you need a mic, and a mic's coming to you. You can have two mics if you want. Hi. Uh, you're in the blurb about your talk. It d talked about could Kasauli area be the origin of the Saraswati River. You didn't talk, talk about it, so I'd like to ask that question. I was hoping I'd duck that. Uh, it's a problematic question. Um, I think there is a commission that has been set up by the government of Haryana to look at the origin of uh, Saraswati. Uh, there are many claimants, uh, many states, uh, which could well be the uh, points of origin of Saraswati. Uh, there are several Paleo rivers, as we call them, that have perhaps uh, could have been Saraswati. So my, my worry is that do we have a Paleo map or at least a map from Indian uh, mythology which says that this is where it flowed? And therefore, we can say it with surety because there are two or three versions to it, and I'm not sure which one would hold. So even if we were to find a Paleo River that passes around Kurukshetra and starts from here, it could well be another river. We don't know. You need to find um, settlements. You need to find scriptures. You need to find definitive answers, and you know not just that. And you know what's happening in the news. I mean, there's been, you know issues about carbon dating of a certain site and you know those are controversial so i think you can't be selective about science if you want to get the full truth get the full truth and be open to change the truth that you've got even that may be malleable your levels of certainty are also some things that you can say with you know that level but you can't say that i'm 100% sure yes, that this happened some last question there's arti you know she yeah. uh, you said that lakes dams, ponds are good for getting this carbon dioxide out. 
we have a series of dams, barrages that come right along the Himalayas, starting from this Koshalya Dam right down there. In the morning, the first thing that I heard was that dams is a cement making guy's requirement. Right. Is it bad or is it good? Okay, what I didn't say advice? dams. I said you need natural lakes and natural ponds. They are natural sinks because what happens is you have algae, the kai, you know, you, do, you don't have a good word for kai, you know, that's the saddest Achha. part, you know, we, everything that is mossy, green, grey, uh, you think it stinks or where, where you can is slip kai. is kai, right, which is, which is perhaps the most uh, detrimental thing you can do because that's what has created all the oxygen that you and I breathe. So let's give, a li give it a little more respect than what we do. My point here is dams, uh, if they were well managed, would have served that purpose. Dams, what they've done is they've diverted the flow of water. The plight of Indus is partly, and I'm again, uh, there might be people willing to shoot me for this, is largely because we have ch altered the flow of Indus, you know. Uh, and that has perhaps also contributed to climate change. My point here is cement industry has a role because cement making itself has a strong uh, emission on carbon dioxide. And the fact that you've stopped the flow of a river like Faraka. Uh, like Faraka Dam or any of these large dams also would do that because you don't have natural recharge, you don't have natural carbon burial. Dam by itself, the reservoir itself is lined. It will not contribute to carbon burial because it will only get uh, more kai, but does, the kai does not know where to go. The, 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 the organisms that are growing there don't know where to sink the carbon. So for that reason, dams are not good, you know, in terms of the climate cycle. Right. So in I'm terms getting, of uh, uh, climate change, uh, yeah, yeah. one of Sir, the I think we should get somebody else to answer this thing. We yeah. have got only two minutes left. Yeah. So, so in so terms of climate change, uh, the we common… We discussed that in the morning, sir, this no, question that you are asking. Okay. No, what I'm saying is, there's a normally associated with carbon and fossil fuels, but there's an alternative uh, thinking which is there in South America. I happen to be there and, and there's a lot of research done on this stuff and what they are saying is it is the uh, the position of the Sun and the earth which over millions of years keeps changing. Very small degree of change takes place over millions of years and this is what is causing climate change. It is not fossil fuels, it is not anything else. Yes, fossil fuels may contribute a very very little thing and you can't reverse this climate change. It, it takes Millions of years to do it. So are, are we, are we some, uh, looking at something different here? No. Uh, what you're talking about is something called Milankovitch cycle. He was a st uh, Croatian statistician who said that there is something called a wobble, you know. And that's going to happen. We can't alter the, the movement of the axis or our distance from the sun. That's going to happen. This year we had the solar flares. Right? So that's going to happen. My point here is... Wow. Okay. I don't know what that was. Okay. Uh, my point is... My point, my point is that there are several contributors to climate change, right? Milankovitch cycle is something that we can't control. You know, we'll need a, a large extraterrestrial spaceship to manage our orbit if, we ca if at all we can do that. Carbon dioxide in our atmosphere is something that is warming up what's called greenhouse effect. It creates a greenhouse. Now, with, with Milankovitch, without Milankovitch, it is going to stay with us even in the best year. This year is the triple La Nina. That means we're gonna, we've already had excessive rains, right? And we should have a pretty strong winter, right? And for example, New Zealand and Australia, our Indian cricket team is already wearing sweaters, although it's summer there, right? The point I'm making here is this is not a wobble Milankovitch year. So what is it that explains the, the sudden La Nina? How do you explain El Nino and La Nina? Because these are variables that are beyond Milankovitch cycle, the, the wobble that you talk about, the distance between Earth and Sun. So I think they contribute, they intensify the effect of climate change, but we should remember that there are several other factors that cause the change in climate that is attributed to us. Uh, on that note, there's so many hands going up. Uh, I'm just going just to... one short question. Sir, what you've done you... three or four questions already. I did already. not do even one. I have not asked one All question. One minute. <laughs> yes, yes sir, come on, please, sir. please, sir. What is the... You said what is so unique about the sediment which is coming down the Himalayas. You said that is something different to anywhere you can find. Yeah, so the silica-rich rock, which is found in this region and the Himalayas, like I said, is granite and that gets washed here. It's got this uh, smile, uh, you know, slight uh, 
silvery tinge to the sands that you see from here. You know, if you see if we had stopped uh, sand mining of our rivers, starting with Kaushalya and going eastwards till say Gaya or even till uh, till Damodar, we would have a very rich amount of silica, which is essential for carbon sinking, right? And we don't have that. Do you know, let me sh share this fact, this is incredible, Bikram, you won't yeah. know this. Do you know that the soil, uh, sorry, the sand uh, of river sand in Kerala, you know, has all been exported because it contains something called thorium, right? Thorium is very, very useful because it's the future of nuclear, nuclear energy. And who's buying it? Of course, the Chinese. Where are we getting the sand? Where is Kerala getting its sand? From the Mekong River Delta. So think about it. They're sending their sand and getting sand in return. And how perverse is that? Because the government has done very little to control the, the thorium smuggling as it is. Right? So those are the kind of perversions that are there. And sand smuggling that is happening all over India is massive. Uh, can I, with uh, your permission, your permission, uh, say that may I request him to take us for a little fossil walk early in the morning. Would, how many of you would like to come? Yes. Gilbert Trail, maybe? Can I ask one last question, please? Yes, can I have one last question, please? <laughs> yes. Yeah, you were mentioning, uh, you know, the 40 feet of uh, where all the best part of the sea, I mean, so do, did you mean plankton? What was the... Yeah, there is some plankton there, mm. but you also find larger things like mollusks, which are snails and gastropods. In fact, there's a beautiful um, uh, oyster bed here, which is a limestone oyster bed. You know, I'm missing a friend of mine called Ritesh Arya, and you know, he's the the local expert. He's brilliant, uh, and I wish he the next year or some year he could show show you around or possibly have an exhibit here, mm -hmm. uh, and he's incredible. Uh, so that's one. And you know, there's another very beautiful thing. I'm, I'm, I forgot to tell you this. The, diff, the, the layer that separates Kasoli and Subathu is a thin volcanic uh, ash, which is called a tephra, right? It, it's thin and white. It's very beautiful to look at. It's used in the porcelain industry. They don't extract that here, thankfully. I mean, you get big bands of volcanic ash. The reason why I'm telling you this is it's a very rare thing to see tephra in, in such localities, like here. The anomaly is this, that most people, most geologists think that it was a volcano east of India because if you remember when the Iceland uh, volcano uh, you know, erupted, Europe went into a bit of a chaos, right? Because moving as, as Earth rotates, most of the, uh, the plume would go eastwards, right? Because Earth ro rotates from east to west, right? right? But in this case, if the emission uh, or, the, or the plume or the volcanic ash that came, if it came from Assam, then it wouldn't have come here. It should have gone towards Myanmar. So how did it come here? Right? So that is the anomaly that you know, we have not solved yet. So this place is, is a tre treasure trove of wonder. And you could do so much research and you know, people should be coming here. And I think uh, we should. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Pranay. There's so many un unanswered questions. And those of you who want to continue chatting with him, we can just go to the lawn and do it. Thank you so much, so much. And I think we need you for five days nonstop. <laughs> <That's laughs> thank right. you very much. Thank you, Bikram. Thank you, Pranay. There is a young lady over there who has a question. Maybe she can yeah, catch she can you. Once you're down from the stage, uh, I have a